than I thought I would wake up right now. So welcome everyone to our 17th meetup. Uh, we are so excited because this is our first uh, meetup in uh, 44. So uh, today we have a lot of topics to talk about and we uh, going to talk about the GitHub Copilot insight. Uh, we have a special guest from Microsoft and our head of back end also uh, going to talk about this topic and also uh, if you guys ever come to our uh, meetup before you may know that uh, there's something different because we just recently moved from another floor and we expanding a lot and we uh, get a chance to have more space for our employees and also uh, to organize the meetup or activities just like this okay usual just let's go to a um, quick review of the 70 bits to some quick review of 70 speak uh, for this event we bring the industrial leader to speak about engaging topic and we are so uh, regularly organize some this kind of uh, meetup it's about technical meetup so you guys uh, got an opportunity to uh, learn from the expert and uh, to get networking so why don't we just know more about 70? Uh, as you can see, these are uh, key numbers of our um, uh, accomplishment. So we've been in our uh, business for more than 15 years and we expanding a lot. So right now we have around 250 people as uh, expertise in digital transformation. And we have around 35 nationalities recently across uh, the world and also uh, we also support 400 um, uh, clients. Uh, this is the face of our Josie, uh, our CEO. And also here is the list and the logo of our uh, clients. We support them uh, from many uh, several uh, business sectors. Okay. And uh, just proudly to present that uh, recently we just got um, the reward as a best place to work from work winter. So the reason behind it, I think one of it's because not only we just um, working hard, but we also pay attention to our uh, employee happiness as well. You can see from the uh, photo and we are also doing a lot of activities here. Uh, we have like a set up uh, and organize the um, physical activities. We playing games, we party uh, gladly as well. Uh, and also just don't forget to follow us on website or any social media because we going to update uh, latest on the event or activities internal and external and also opening position as well. So because we are hiring, we are looking for the talented developers and designers. As you can see, these are the positions that we are recently uh, looking for. So if you guys know some potential candidates, you can feel free to contact us on the website. We are looking for platform engineer, solution architecture, and uh, tech lead web, quality assurance, and data analytics, and delivery. Okay. And so today for the topic, as I mentioned, uh, we have a special guest and this is uh, all the agenda for today. Uh, we have Brandon Matheson from Microsoft. He will get you through the introductions to GitHub Copilot. And also uh, Jose Barbosa uh, will talk about the developer diaries. 
and after that we will have our networking and dinner. And also your feedback is very important, so you guys please feel free to uh, take a photo here because uh, when after we finish, uh, you guys have to show the feedback a little bit for <laughs> get the pizza <laughs> and beer. <laughs> okay. And uh, we also have a lot of uh, meetup coming up on November as well. The next coming up will be a Gen AI meetup on November 1st on Wednesday. Uh, we have partnered with Microsoft and Accenture with Ashu, Apapon, and Kuntiwa. So uh, please feel free to uh, register over that QR code so you can uh, register it in advance mm -hmm. and you can take a picture and yeah that's all for uh, the introduction and hope you guys enjoy this evening so let me just uh, invite uh, Kun Brandon Matheson from Microsoft to be our speaker Hello, good evening. So today I'm going to talk to my GitHub co-pilot. Okay, so thanks everyone for joining tonight. My name is Brendan Matheson, you can call me Bren, from Microsoft uh, ASEAN, but I'm actually based here in Thailand. Um, let, me, let me just ask before I start my slides, who has actually tried co-pilot before? Wow, quite a few people, awesome. Who is using it every day of, of you guys who are trying? Okay, quite a few. Who has not tried it at all yet? Who's never tried it and is here to find out what it's all about? Okay, it's about half-half. All right, interesting, all right. So I'm gonna give you an introduction to Copilot and I'm also gonna show you a live demo of Copilot. And um, I'm also, I also wanna invite you to ask me questions when I get through that demo piece. If you have any specific use cases or any, con any kind of um, challenges, you want to throw at Copilot, um, start thinking about that now. So I'll, I'll be happy to try things live and we'll see what happens with, with Copilot. So just briefly to introduce myself. Um, I've been, my background is software engineering. So I've been programming since I was six and worked for about 20 years as a developer in different capacities uh, from developer through to architect. Um, in 2018 to 22, so about four and a half years, I worked for AWS as a consultant in AWS ProServe, if you're familiar with that team. Um, and most recently, last year, I moved to Microsoft, actually my second time with Microsoft, where I'm the ASEAN app, app Innovation Lead, which means I help customers to build um, applications on Azure, so primarily things to do with cloud native, appli cloud -native applications, containers, as well as dev productivity, at, um, including DevOps and GitHub. And if you'd like to connect, that's my short URL for my LinkedIn, so brand.cc slash LinkedIn. So here's my agenda for today. I'm gonna skip the first one, I'm gonna jump straight to what is Copilot. So we'll have a look at what is Copilot. I'm gonna just walk through a few sort of basic informational slides about Copilot so you can understand what, it, what its features and functions are, how it works. And then we'll move into a live demo. Most of my time I'll spend on the demo actually. So I'll, I'll go through a few different scenarios and as I said, if you've got anything in mind you'd like to see if Copilot can do, you can feel free to throw that at me towards the end of that demo. I will also, um, talk a bit about return on investment because we talk a lot about productivity when we talk about LLMs and, and generative AI and Copilot. And I have a particular perspective on that I'd like to share with you about how you should think about what the value you get from Copilot specifically is. And then just a few slides on how you can onboard with Copilot and open for questions and answers. So first of all, what is Copilot? So we call Copilot the AI pair programmer. 
and it really kind of fits into the same posi position as what pair programming we used to do a lot back in the late 90s, early 2000s, where as a developer, I might invite a colleague to, co to come and sit next to me and to help me to think through the problem I'm trying to solve, come up with different approaches, maybe actually debate as well. The, the debate is also a big part of that. So debating the pros and cons of different solutions is how we get to better outcomes with code. So Copilot actually fulfills kind of the same role in terms of it sitting next to you as an AI, giving you different ideas and options, and also maybe in some way debating with you a little bit about how to write some code. So Copilot fundamentally, it works as an add-on for your IDE. So here's my IDE on the right-hand side, and I install the Copilot add-on into my IDE. We support a bunch of IDEs today, which I'll show you in a moment. And as I'm writing my code, just as normal, Copilot is constantly monitoring what I'm doing, just sort of observing what I'm doing and trying to understand effectively the intent of what I'm trying to create. And based on that intent, it comes up with suggestions which it presents, which I can either accept if they are good suggestions or I can just ignore them if they're no good. These are sort of some behaviors we, we kind of see. This is not really features, but it's just sort of behaviors we see from Copilot. So one sort of behavior you could observe is con converting comments to code. So for example, here in my code, I've got this comment on line five and six where I've explained what I'm trying to do, determine whether the sentiment of something other is positive or negative, and use a web service. So based on that comment, Copilot is able to understand the intent of what I'm trying to achieve, and it's able to suggest a block of code to fulfill that intent. And again, I can review that, see if it looks good. If I like it, I can, I can accept it. If I don't like it, I can just ignore it or provide more context. Another behavior we see is autofill for repetitive code. So oftentimes there's things we have to do very repetitively. So for example, in this file, I've got an import statement to import the fetch library. So that's something I have to do in many, many files. So once Copilot recognizes that, it can start to short circuit that for us and give us a suggestion to fill that out quickly, or effectively an autofill. Um, so alternatives, so um, sort of back to the pair programming idea. As I'm writing code, I might get not just one suggestion, but multiple different suggestions that I can choose from and I can evaluate which one I think looks the best for my purposes. So. That's kind of the basic idea of Copilot. This is some feedback we've gotten from the market. So we have different feedback at different times, many different surveys we've done. So I don't really like to dwell on the specific numbers, but the trend from all the surveys we've done is, is pretty consistent, which is that most people feel that they're faster, more productive, and also more satisfied when they're using Copilot. For me, this one's kind of the most important because, not because we want people to be satisfied, of course we do, but what this is telling us is that Copilot is taking away the boring, repetitive work and letting our developers focus on creative problem solving type work. So that's where that satisfaction kind of comes from. So it's kind of a proxy metric that lets us see that Copilot is actually doing what we want it to do. Has some additional feedback here from the market. So these are some tweaks that we've captured over time and I won't read through these tweaks, but you can, if you, you can read s some of the comments there. The theme is kind of the same as what I was just sharing about speed and productivity. The interesting thing is these developers are some of the top developers from tech companies around the world. So even these guys who are senior and principal level developers are getting benefit from GitHub Copilot. So the interesting thing is that Copilot helps different skill levels in different ways. If you're a principal or a senior, or like a, a really well-established developer, someone who knows their craft very well already, Copilot will help you basically just to go faster. It's, it's a purely a speed boost because you know what good software looks like, you know what good code looks like, and this just lets you get to that good code quicker. So for principal and seniors, it helps that way. For junior devs, it also provides a speed boost, but it's also providing a skills boost. So if I'm not familiar with a language or a technology or a library, Copilot can help me to fi fill in my knowledge gaps and show me how to use that language or, or framework. So it actually helps across the, across the skill levels, but in slightly different ways. Okay, as I mentioned, Copilot fundamentally runs as an add-on in your IDE. So today we support these IDEs, so Visual Studio Code. It's really the, the primary one, actually. GitHub Code Spaces, which is actually, if you're not familiar, that's Visual Studio Code in the cloud. Um, so it's like a, a hosted IDE in the cloud. Uh, Visual Studio on Windows, um, all the JetBrains IDEs, so IntelliJ, um, I forget the names, PyStorm, WebSpark, all those IDEs, Writer. And I think I, uh, from my testing as well, Android Studio, which is based on uh, the IntelliJ framework, is also, it actually works there as well. And finally, NeoVim, which I've never used, but I met one guy yesterday who's used it, so that was my first person who's used NeoVim. Um, 
going a bit deeper on the flow. So here I'm back in my IDE and I'm writing some code. And again, as I write my code, as I write my code, uh, the add-on that's in the IDE is grabbing context, what we call context, which is effectively code snippets. And it's sending that context across to the GitHub Copilot service, which runs actually on Azure, in the Azure cloud, which in turn then talks to the OpenAI large language models, which also run in Azure, Microsoft Azure. And from these OpenAI models, we get back what we call raw suggestions. So just sort of unfiltered suggestions of, of new code snippets. It says OpenAI Codex there, but actually we've upgraded it to OpenAI open uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo. So this slide's a little bit old now. So we get back raw suggestions from OpenAI. We actually then apply some filtering and some, some cleaning really in the uh, GitHub Copilot service. So for example, we check for security vulnerabilities. We wanna make sure that suggestions, for example, don't contain SQL injection vulnerabilities. We also do license checks to make sure that your code, that the suggestion is not too similar to a open source piece of code, which could be an, uh, a breach of a license. And there's other policy checks that you can define which get applied there. Finally, the, the clean suggestions get passed back to the add-on in the IDE and then we're presented, uh, they're presented to you in the IDE. So that's the basic flow. And I'm gonna pause there. Are there any questions about this flow? Because I think it questions a big point. So I'll just open it up to questions. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, ah. Okay. Thanks for that question because I forgot to mention that. So the question was, when we talk about context, are we talking about just this file or other files? So that's a great question. When we talk about context, we're talking about what you see in this file and other open tabs, okay? But not files that are just in your project, like in the same directory structure. At the moment, it doesn't go to that level. Um, so yeah, that's the context. And it's important to understand that because sometimes to get Copilot to do what you want it to do, you're gonna actually open up secondary tabs with, for example, sample code, or even I've seen some customers open, like have a file that defines their coding standard and have that on the side. So the Copilot can see that and generate code that follows your code standard based on that being in, in context. Yeah, yes. Do you, do you send our code back to uh, train your neural networks on? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, that's almost always the first question I get from customers. The first question is usually, you're sending our code across to your server, do you keep our code and do you, do you use our code for training? So it's a very clear no to both of those. We don't keep any code and we don't use the code to train the model, okay? So, and, and by the way, this is spelled out in the terms of service and the privacy policy and one of the documents as well. So we make it extremely clear that we, we, we don't retain the code. It's a pre-trained model, so we don't use any kind of reinforcement training on, on this model. The context is sent across just for the suggestion. So it's effectively the prompt, like when you're using ChatGPT, it's basically the prompt. After we've gotten that suggestion, we then discard the, the context, throw it away. Over here, yes, but what we send across, well, basically the add-on has to manage, not the whole folder, just what's open in tabs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Actually, so I've had this discussion with the product manager of Copilot. There's, there's been um, different experiments with that. It's not quite, it's not giving the, the best results yet. So there's more that has to be done to, to figure out how to make that work. The best results today come from what we do today, which is to use the context, the, the code that's in, in your current tab and related tabs. It lets you actually control what context is being sent across. If you imagine a very large project where we're picking up every single file that's in the project, that could lead to very skewed results. So this at the moment is giving us the best results. Okay, I can't, I can't debate that point, but yeah. It, uh, at the moment it uses the, the code that's in context, in, in the open tabs. Okay, more questions, yeah, yeah. Actually, why don't you include those instructions in the prompt before sending? I, okay, good question. So the question was, why do we have the additional cleanup at the co-pilot level? Why don't we have that in like a meta prompt that gets sent across to the LM? I don't know what the, yeah, I don't, don't know the answer to that, what the constraints that are there. I imagine because we, we're not, it's not purely based on the LM prompt. There's additional different checks that are done. So there's actually some additional AI that's applied for the security check. 
I don't know that that could be woven into the, actually, yeah, no, I, could, I, I remember that. So the security check is based on, if I remember correctly, CodeQL. So when we get code back from here, we use CodeQL. CodeQL, if you haven't heard of it, is the language that's used behind GitHub Advanced Security for doing uh, static analysis. So we're actually doing a static analysis check as opposed to just relying on an LLM, LLM prompt to generate that code. And I think also the policy checks, other checks, they, they kind of need to be done there because it's different techniques. Yeah, that's my yeah. understanding, yeah. Amir. Uh, additional question about Linux. Um, how, how, how long could be these uh, files, open files? Because you can like put the thousands of rows in these uh, open files. And then second question, uh, um, is there some checking for execution like because this uh, additional code, suggested code can be like uh, doesn't work at all? Okay, so the first question was really about token limit. So are we, can we hit a token limit if we have a large file? I don't, I don't actually know exactly how that's managed, but the add-on is responsible for managing what it sends across to the service. So some there's logic in there to manage, to make sure we don't hit token li limits. I've never seen it come back with an error of that type, even working on large projects. So I, I don't know the details of how that works, but I think it's kind of, there's some attempts to cover that off. In terms of the quality of the code that comes back, so we call it Copilot, not Autopilot, because you're still, you still own the code. It's you're still responsible for the code that comes back. So it is possible you would get code back that's maybe wrong in some fashion. So it's up to you to still make sure that's correct. That means that all the tools you use today, like for example, automation testing, um, static analysis, secret scanning, code scanning, code reviews, all of those techniques and tools still apply. So you can't just rely on GitHub to give you perfect code back, right? The purpose of GitHub is not to give you perfect code, but help to help you write your code faster. So there may be some small mistakes along the way you have to clean up on top of what it, what it pr provides you. Thanks. Thanks. I have a following question. Sure. Uh, let's say I open a pen drop uh, and now 20 tabs. How about the performance? Okay. So if I have a lot of tabs open, will the, will the performance be impacted? I d again, I don't know the answer to that, but I would I would think that it's up to the add-on to manage that as well. So it's it's the bridge between what's going on in your IDE and what it sends across to the to the back end. So I think it's something in there, but I don't know specifically specifically how that's handled. Normally, how the performance is generally, uh, at least I tried um, Git uh, uh, injection test, GitLab. Uh, yep. Sure. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty slow. Uh, right. I, I don't Terrible. want to use it because <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm pretty hardened on GitLab UI. Right. Uh, so I never tried the GitLab uh, performance. How fast it is. From okay, from my experience, it depends on the size of the result. So how long it takes to generate that result, you'll see in a moment when I do my demo. So there's small code snippets come out super fast. Larger blocks of code, or when it's generating a whole function or a whole class, it does take maybe a few seconds. Yep. I have another question. Sure. So let's say it suggests the uh, say this uh, concept, does it also suggest unit tests? It can, it can, yep. How, how do I? Let me show you that. I'll show you that in a second. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. So the question was, can it generate unit tests? Yes, for sure. Okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'm going to keep going. Got one, one more slide, and then I'll jump into the demo. Okay. Let me just show you this slide real quick. So this is a uh, kind of a roadmap of Copilot. So we have Copilot's been in market since June. Well, <laughs> GA since June last year generally available since June last year. So it's a bit over a year old. Um, and that original version of Copilot, you're gonna see in a second, is where I can write code and it helps me to write my code. You might have heard of something called Copilot X, which is not a product, it's more of an umbrella. It's like a category or a group of new features that are coming from GitHub Copilot. So we can see over here, go Copilot tomorrow. Some of this is now available, like unit testing, like finding code errors, but then there's also some things that are still coming like um, AI pull requests, that's coming soon, documentation. So there's more features coming from Copilot that are not yet available. Right now we have kind of the first version of Copilot plus Copilot chat, which I'm gonna show you as well. 
but the point is that there's still much more in the pipeline to Copilot. And actually, let me show you the pipeline, the roadmap real quick. Hello, hello. Okay. This website called githubnext.com, this is basically the public roadmap for what's going on at GitHub. So if you scroll down here, you'll see these two guys. These are features that are currently in waitlist and they hopefully will be available soon. Previously, Copilot chat was in here, but now it's in beta. Yeah, so the next ones we're waiting for are Copilot for pull requests and Copilot for docs. So these two features are not really code re like r related to writing code as the main Copilot features are. These are more extending into the broader workflows. So Copilot for pull requests, if you use GitHub as your version control, when you're creating a pull request, this feature will help you to write the, like review the pull request, write the comment, and so on and so forth. Copilot for docs applies LLM to documentation body. So if you're looking at trying to find an answer to a, how do, you, how do I do something with React, for example, you can actually get that answer from, from the documentation, but summarized for you by Copilot for docs. Let me show you that. So yeah, for, for, for example, if I'm trying to do something with React, I can ask my question that the question you might typically Google or, or maybe Stack Overflow and get the answer, but you're getting the answer based on the documentation, so it should be more of an authoritative answer. So these two features are hopefully coming soon. There's more that you can see there in the roadmap at GitHubNext.com. And you can also, by the way, sign up to be on the waiting list for some of these upcoming features. So if you're interested to get your hands on those sooner, you can sign up to the wait list for those. Okay. Let me go back to my slides and okay, let's go to the demo. So I'm gonna have to put down the mic here a bit. Okay, we're going okay for time. So I've got about, I'll try to cover the main bit of the demo in about 20 minutes and let you guys ask me questions. So the scenario I've got here, let me zoom that a little bit. Can you guys see that okay? All right, so the scenario I've got here, I've built a basic microservice using Node.js, and it's the widget microservice, so I'm gonna be managing widgets with this. So basically, I wanna create a RESTful API to do get, post, put, delete of widgets. So far, I've, I've linked in the Express.js framework and for my API definition, and the Pinot framework for logging, and I've done some basic wiring to get those services connected up, and I've set up a skeleton service that's listening on port, 3000. So the first thing I want to do is I want to start to create RESTful routes, like REST API handlers. So I want to create one to allow me to get back a widget based on its ID. So I'm going to do that by, by typing a comment here rather than writing code. I've given it the comment, get request handler to return a single widget by ID. And if you look down here, the bottom right hand corner, that just down here in the bottom right hand corner, that's the copilot icon. When it's producing a suggestion, you'll see that spin. Okay, so if you're ever wondering, is copilot doing anything? Just have a look and see if that's spinning. So when I press enter, it's spinning and it's come back with a suggestion. So that was, it took that much time. Back to your question, that's how much time it took to produce a suggestion. So here it's come up, what you see in gray, that's the suggestion from Copilot. And here what it's actually done is it's identified from the context it can see that I'm using Express.js, so it's come up with app.get, which is how you define a route in Express.js. From my comment, it knows that I wanna get a single widget by ID, so it's come up with the uh, request path slash, wi slash widget slash ID replacement variable. It's got the delegate, the anonymous function for handling the get request. And within that function, it's actually tried to implement the function, but in this case, there's nothing in context that lets it know how would I actually get a widget, for example, from a database. So it's kind of fallen back to just logging the body, the request body, and then returning a, a response, which is including the request query as the body of the response. So although it's kind of a placeholder at the moment because I don't have the rest of my stack implemented, it's a pretty good start, so I'm gonna accept that. And of course, once I have built out the data access tier, I could come back and get Copilot to help me write, rewrite this function to go and get data from the database. So that's a just a really simple initial example to show you 
that Copilot can understand the intent of your comment, the context around it, and produce a, a piece of code, actually in this case, a correct piece of code from, from that context. All right, <coughs> let me um, open up the file explorer here. I'm gonna kind of carry on with this scenario. So if I was building this application in, in reality, because I'm gonna be handling widget resources in many, many pieces of parts of my application, my microservice, I'm gonna have, I wanna have a widget class which represents a single widget in flight in memory. So I'm gonna create a new widget class here. Let me go ahead and create a new file. So I'm creating a file called widgets.cs. I'm gonna use TypeScript here. And I my widget is gonna have an ID property, which will be a string, but actually holding a, a UUID or a GUID value, and the name property, which will be a string as well. So to work with the UIDs, I need to import the UID package or UID library. So let me do that. And having typed just that much so far, the gray that's popped up again is from Copilot. So this is an example of you know, that repetitive code, autofill for repetitive code. So I'm able to just hit tab to complete that and that is actually what I want, so that's cool. So if I come down here, when I come down one line, so actually Copilot understands not only the context, what the coder can see, but also where you are in the file at any given point in time. So typically when we're writing a, a, a class, we'll have the import statements, a blank line, and then that's where we've got our class. So in fact, Copilot has recognized that's where we are and it's said, okay, maybe you wanna create a class here. So it's picked up the name from the name of the file, widget, widget.ts, there it is. So that's the name of the class that it's chosen. It's also had a good guess at what should a widget class have as properties. So it says ID, name, and string, which is close to what I want. I want ID and name for sure, but not string, so, but not description. So I'm gonna accept that, but I'm gonna go back and then I'm gonna delete the bits that I don't want. So I'm gonna delete that description property. Hold on. Yep. And the assignment and the constructor arg. So this is this is like in this is a simple example of what happens in reality. You won't get the exact code you want every time, but you might get something that's close to what you want. So you you get a suggestion, then you may go back and then reshape it a bit and then get another suggestion. So it's very it much very much an iterative process. All right. So actually, in this case, this is actually not quite right because it's giving me it's giving me a constructor to take the name as an argument but it's generating a UID, uh, like a new UID value for the ID, which is not always correct. Like if I'm deserializing a, a widget from the database, it's already got an ID. So I wanna be able to sometimes rehydrate an existing widget, sometimes create a new widget. So I actually need two different cases, one taking an ID and one generating, generating an ID. However, in TypeScript or in JavaScript, you're gonna have a single constructor. So what we're gonna do is delete this out, delete this uh, constructor, and I'm going to give some uh, guidance to Copilot on what I actually want here. So just fix that formatting. Sometimes the formatting is not perfect. So again, you still need your code cleanup feature of your IDE, you, it doesn't replace that. So let me type out a comment here. So I've given it the comment, I've said static factory methods to create an existing widget or a new widget. So hopefully Copilot understands what I mean by that. An existing widget should require both ID and name as properties, whereas an, a new widget would require only, only a name. So let's see if it's able to figure that out. Okay, it's helping me with my comment as well. Okay, so it's come up with a static factory method, create existing taking the ID as a name, uh, the ID is a string and the name is a string. So that looks kind of okay, although I would prefer to use the constructor, but let me accept that for now. Let's see, it's spinning and okay, now it's got to create new where it's generating, generating the ID for the new widget, so that's correct. And okay, it's producing a constructor. Let's see what happens here. Okay. So this is um, interesting because normally I've done this particular demo of this example maybe five times. 
and today did something different. So Copilot is not deterministic. This is actually the fun part of demoing Copilot. Is sometimes it does weird stuff. What I've seen it do before is create a private constructor taking both both parameters, as both properties as args, and then calling that constructor from a static function message. But in this case, it's created an empty constructor, and it's done assignments in the function method. So again, you won't always you won't always get what you would want or expect. Sometimes you have to then go back and reiterate. So let me actually wipe this out and give it some additional instructions in the in the comments. All right. Okay. I'm going to delete my function methods because now they're causing me problems. That again. Okay, this is what I expected, what I've what it's done before. Again, sometimes it does different stuff. So I've now given it, I've prompted it to create the constructor that I needed. Now, if I go back and reprompt on the stac static function methods, it is actually calling that constructor internally in, inside those methods. So that's kind of what I was expecting the first time around, what it usually does. But again, today it's done something different. So again, I mean, it's actually a good example. You know, Copilot does different things and you have to kind of sometimes nudge it to get it to do exactly what you want. Basically, it comes down to what context context you give it. Okay, let me pause there. I'm going to switch to some other demo points here, but any questions on what I've showed you so far? These are very simple demos, of course, but maybe trigger some questions, yep. Remove, can it remove, like, code that you wrote other way? Like, for example, like, you, you have, like, uh, constructors, right? But then... Like you delete a description by yourself. Is it possible to like just tell them to remove the description during the constructor? Okay, so it doesn't remove code, so it will always generate new suggestions in this mode. But the next mode I'm going to show you, which is chat mode, it can actually rewrite your code and sometimes take out elements. So what I'm showing you so far, it's, it's just going to be additive. Yeah. Or any other. Um, is it right. possible to like? Can it read like all types of files? You say like for the chat. It can, it can. So if I had a, a markdown document containing, if I had a markdown document containing my documentation and my use cases, it will actually read that. Okay. Yep. And so like all all file that is like text based. I'm not sure about yeah text based yes. I'm not sure about PDF, but markdown certainly yeah. I remember that you mentioned that the code pilot um, reads the coding standard or code style, but uh, in this example, in the demo, I didn't see the uh, tab space. Okay. So I is there a configuration file in code pilot so we can set the coding style and parent? There's not. There's not, but <laughs> what you can do is you can influence Copilot okay. by having your standards in a file. Let's say, if you can imagine this markdown document. Uh, let's see if I have we can create, this is what I've seen some customers do. We can create a file which is just like a sample um, Java file or a C Sharp file, whatever, which, do, which gives you examples of what our code standard looks like. Copilot will, will take that as context and it will typically, again, not always, but it will generally start to follow that as your standard. Also, the code you've got in context as well, of course. I mean, I've seen it when I was first using Copilot. The first thing it did was generate a field with underscore, underscore prefix. So I deleted that because I don't like that. In the next property it generated, it did not include the underscore. So it does kind of pick up what you're doing. It's not learning, it's just taking that as the, the context for the prompt that it comes across. So you can't configure it, but you can influence it. Okay, yeah. I have another question. So it's sure. not related about this. Is there, a, I, I saw the roadmap, uh, yeah. and uh, is there an option to add more features for code review? For code review? Okay, let me come back to that. Yeah, sure. Right, no I'm going to show you something around that in a second. Yep. Do you have a question? I can hear you, Andrew. Hello. Um, I had a question. Uh, how does Git, how do we know that GitHub Copilot is not doing something wrong with our secret files? Or like is there a git ignore or something that you could use to prevent that? That is a qu I actually don't know the answer to that question. I should know it. Um, I've had this question recently from a customer and I haven't actually had a chance to go dig into that. So if you want to know the answer to that, connect with me on LinkedIn or I'll, I'll get the answer for you. Yep. Thanks. 
Is there any way to know whether this code has been written by a human or a good fellow? I don't know if there's a way to post analyze it. Yeah. You trying to catch somebody up? I'm not sure. Uh, GitHub Copilot prompt or comment can we put like the norm for the code that we would like to get from your Copilot? Um, like in the, the limitation. Comment? Yes, like if if I would like to get only like limit of of the number of line of code or right. the number of input or right. variable, is that possible for Copilot to interpret that and generate? I think so. I think so. Let's if we have time, I'll come back and try that out. Okay. Yep. But um, I think you can, I think you should be able to provide that kind of instruction in the comment, and it should follow that. But let's come back and try that. Yep. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, Copilot is uh, depend on the current uh, user behavior on writing code or no? Right. So is it, uh, for example, if developer used to use some bad practices, it's uh, again, uh, <laughs> suggest some bad practice or no? Sure, sure. So basically, Copilot has no memory. It's basically stateless. So what it knows is what it, is what it sees in your IDE right now. So if you do something and then you close your IDE, reopen it, you're starting to again from scratch. So there's no kind of session state or, or memory of past um, interactions like you've had with it before. So there is no way to misleading the Copilot for only you can only mislead it by what you've got in context, what you've got open in tabs at any mm. given point in time. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, first of all, uh, Copilot is really cool. I've been using it since Alpha. It's amazing. Um, but there's th there were always concerns about um, the AI is making le learning code that's uh, copyrighted, and there has been steps taken by Microsoft. Especially recently, last month, there was a new Copilot uh, something where Microsoft said that they would take uh, blame for if there were any copyright infringement. So uh, up to what extent and who are the customers that Microsoft is going to take yeah, compliance for? I can't answer that question. I haven't dug dug into that enough. I'm more on the technical side, not on the legal side. But if you want to know the answer to that, again, connect with me and I'll find the right person to help you. Yep. OK, let me uh, switch gears a little bit. I'm going to shut this file. So what I've showed you so far is what I would call original Copilot or Copilot um, inline. I call it Copilot inline. So we're writing code in our IDE and we're getting suggestions inline in the IDE. That's the original mode of Copilot, but we have a new mode which is called chat mode. So if I click my navbar here, I've got the Copilot chat add-on installed, which is a separate add-on to the main Copilot. And Copilot chat comes up in a sidebar here, as you can see. So with Copilot Chat, we have more of a chat, obviously a chat style interaction with the, the the service. And we can do things like ask questions or give it instructions of things we want to do. So for me, really these two things, they don't overlap, they do serve different purposes. Inline mode, if you like, that really f is for if you know what you want to do and you just want some help to write that code faster. Whereas chat mode is good for two main things, for in, in my view. One is analysis, so if you want to get insights about some code or you want to get some feedback about code, then chat mode is where you can actually ask questions and get sort of that kind of analysis. And the other thing that Copilot chat is good for is like big tasks. So if you've got a really big job you want to assign to Copilot and you want to get, get it to write a bunch of code for you, then Copilot chat is good for that. So let me show you some examples of those two use cases. First of all, in my back in my main index.js where I started writing code before, here it is. Um, the first thing I can do is I can ask for, maybe I'm new to the team, and there's a bunch of code that was written by other developers and I need help to understand that code. So what I can do here is I can ask Copilot chat to explain the code for me. So this is a very generic prompt. I could, I could be more specific, but just to keep it simple, I've just said explain this code. And Copilot chat has read the code that I've highlighted. By the way, I've highlighted the code I'm interested in to make it focus on that, that bit of code. And it's giving me a plain language, a plain English explanation of that code. So this could be helpful. 
Actually, again, I could ask more specific questions like um, how is the service um, launched, for example. Um, you can also get it to explain in your own language. So for example, in Thailand, a lot of my customers do this. I explain this code in Thai. And the, the, rea the reality is this is, <laughs> this is not just a gimmick, actually. The reality is this is actually valuable. Hey, Chango, is this, is this mic okay? Is this microphone okay? Okay. The reality is that this actually does serve a purpose because there's many people who are just more comfortable using their own native language, whether it's Thai, whether it's Vietnamese, whether it's Tagalog. So we do see customers doing this and actually getting value from this, uh, this capability. Um, okay, another, another um, analysis type of, of um, use case would be I could um, ask this, ask Hotel Chat, how could I improve this code? How could I prove this pod? Okay, a bit of a typo, but I think it still understands the FDK. So, okay, it was a generic prompt. I didn't really, s well, it wasn't too specific about what kind of improvement I'm looking for, but I could say, how can I improve for performance or, or reduce complexity or maintainability, testability, those types of, of things. So even with my generic prompt, it has come back with a few, admittedly fairly generic uh, suggestions, but they are relevant. So for example, it's noticed that I've got a hard-coded port here, port 3000 is hard coded, so it says maybe I should externalize that to a environment variable. Um, same for the log level and a bunch of other stuff. I, I don't know what else it suggested, but yeah, it's given me a bunch of suggestions. It's also then gone ahead and given me some example code for how I could adopt those suggestions. So let's see here. Uh, here it is configuring the logger, getting the log levels from the environment variable, so that's that's an improvement, and I don't see it, but somewhere in here it's picked the port up from, from the, um, there it is. Picked the port up from the, from the environment variable as well. So back to your question, I think you were asking if it can delete code. It doesn't really delete code so much, but it can rewrite your code. It can maybe leave bits out, change parts of your code in, in chat mode. Uh, in chat mode, it can do that. In inline mode, it just adds new code, but in chat mode, it can rewrite your code. So if I like this, I could actually just go ahead and click, let me select on the right-hand side. I could go ahead and accept this change just by clicking this button at the top here. And that's updated my, my actual code. Okay, what else can I do here? I could um, I could ask it other improvement suggestions like how could I make this code more secure? Is there a SQL injection? How can I fix the SQL injection? That kind of thing. Let me move to um, giving it tasks. So someone asked before about writing tests, unit tests. So we can do that. I'm gonna select that code we generated before with Copilot, the one that creates the get request handler. And I'm going to get Copilot chat to write some tests for me. Oh, this is for you. <laughs> so, okay, I just said write unit tests. Again, fairly generic, I wasn't specific about what kind of tests I want to see. But even so, chat was able to have a look at my code that I highlighted. Again, I highlighted the code I was interested in, just that one function. And it's able, it's been able to come up with a whole um, test class using uh, something, I, I don't know what framework it's using. Is, does anyone know Sinon? Is that a test framework? I've never seen that before. Mock framework, oh, thanks, thanks, Pierre. Uh huh. Okay, I'm not, I'm not seeing where the. Okay. Oh, that's the application code. Sorry. Anyway. Yeah, I think it is the Spy framework. Anyway, it's created. I think it's maybe using Jest. I'm not sure. But it's created test cases anyway, and it's created a positive test case here. It's also created a test case to verify the code path where the log message gets emitted to the log framework. So it's actually kind of white box test it. It's looked at the code and it's actually come up with test cases based on what it knows the code will do. So again, I could be more specific. I could say, do this input or should we do this output, that kind of thing. And it would generate those types of test cases. 
but even with those generic prompts, you can see that it can do that. Um, okay, let me, so that's kind of um, analysis and a little bit of generative um, kind of prompts. Let me give it, um, okay, let me try this one. So one thing when notorious for as developers is not documenting our code. So let's say write notorious dot comment for this code. So again, it's this in, this in this case, it's rewriting the code, but it's adding, as you can see, those JS dot comments with the uh, metadata tags for each function and each um, class and so forth. So again, this can be helpful to you know, make your code more documented. And here, of course, you could generate HTML docs, that kind of thing. Okay, let me um, try this one. So another example, the profile chat is good for is if you've got, let's say, for example, we've got 50 microservices in our portfolio, but 49 of those are written in JavaScript, uh, sorry, C-sharp, and this is the last one left in JavaScript if we want to migrate it to C-sharp. So we can actually get some help from Copilot chat to do that. So I'll say rewrite this code in C-sharp. So, okay, it's rewriting the code in C-sharp. And the interesting thing here is it's not just like mapping one sort of language to another, it's actually mapping the intent. So it understands what's the result of the code on the right-hand side, which is to create a, an API um, driven microservice. And on the left, it's actually recreated the, or created code to fulfill that same intent in C Sharp using the idiomatic libraries and, and structures. So for example, it's using ASP.NET Core, it's using Microsoft extensions logging. Um, so it's really mapped the intent, not the code, and it's produced the equivalent result in C Sharp. So this won't, just to be clear, this won't help you port a whole application from one language to another, but it will help you to do it faster. So you, you have to go file by file to do that, and you have to still probably do some additional cleanup and refactoring and maybe even um, other improvements on top of this, but it does, it does obviously help you to go faster. Um, okay, I think, yep, let me switch gears a little bit. So let me give you another example. Let's say this application we want to deploy it in on Kubernetes. So this is an example of a big task, and actually an example of not just application code, but also infrastructure as code, from doing Terraform, or CloudFormation, or Azure RM, or Kubernetes, then I can actually still use Copilot to get some benefit from that. So let me pipe a, I'll put the mic down for this one, because it's quite long. What I said is write a Kubernetes manifest to deploy my image widget service in a six pod replica set with an Nginx ingress and let's encrypt for TLS. Let's see if it's able to come up with something useful there. So a deployment, six pod deployment, service, ingress, using the Nginx controller, and I think I saw cert manager. Yeah, it's got Cert Manager as well. So it's actually fulfilled that whole intent with with um, one prompt, actually. And of course, I could add more refinement to that, and I could further iterate on top of that. But yeah, for infrastructure as code, it's actually quite good as well. So another example, let's say I wanted to spin up an AKS cluster on Azure. I just said, write a Terraform template to create an AKS cluster in across three AZs in the East Asia region. So it's picked up the Azure RM um, provider. And okay, it's gone too fast, but basically it looks like it's done okay. Create a resource group, created a cluster. 
Okay, I think there's probably some more work to do here, but it's actually done a pretty good base job. And I, of course, I would keep reprompting and refining that prompt to get what I want. So two points here. One is you can get to do big, big tasks like this, and also infra infrastructure as code is a great use case for Copilot as well. Okay, um, how much time do we have left, Chandra? Five minutes, okay. I'm gonna skip the rest of my slides, but if you have questions about pricing or onboarding or any of those questions, you can ask me afterwards. Does anyone have a challenge for Copilot? Anything you want me to try, maybe we can break it? Yeah. Um, can we use Copilot for like, uh, to find in this, uh, to find the, in this chat just some uh, connections between classes interfaces when we have a, like uh, a complex inheritance here? Okay, so yes and no. So again, it depends on if it's in, con if it's in context, if it's open in the tab. So for example, I, I, I did skip it, but I do have, I'll, I'll give you a really quick example. So over here I've defined a, an interface which defines the methods I want to have on my data access tier. So what I'm going to do is create a new file which to implement this using Cosmos DB as the back end, okay? And I'm going to probably start by typing out some imports to import the widget type and the iWidget data service type. All right, Copilot's kicked in, it's helping me out, okay. So now if I make sure that those types are open in, in context. So there's widget, data service, and there's widget. Then I can get it to actually, oh actually, it's already prompt, it's already uh, suggested an implementation, kind of a basic implementation, but it's giving me, it's actually picked up the method from that interface, so it's, it's able to kind of provide that, that generation. Is that? Keep what you're asking for, or are you looking for something? Okay. Oh, yeah, um, I mean, when we have like a class, for example, animal, and we have like different uh, another classes like cat, dogs, and another. We have different sure. methods, and we have like another meta class like pets. And uh, can we just ask in this chat about connections between these? Who is the child of which classes, okay. and so on? Okay. I would have to try it. My guess is probably not, because that's kind of starting to cross files. It's really file by file, the way that it works today. So it doesn't really, it un doesn't understand different, different content in different files and how it relates, but it can use content in different files to generate content in your code. Oh yeah, it, and also it doesn't use some like graph structure of your dependencies. No, no. Okay, and even like direct structure, like folders, folders. Right. Okay, yeah. got it. Yep. Thanks. Sure. Okay, yeah. Um, like I, I use Copilot quite a lot, um, just because I'm a big bad coder. <laughs> but I often find uh, it suggests me like a really big chunk of code, and it starts out nicely. So I kind of want to accept like a few lines maybe, and then continue from then on because then I can I don't know start out with a variable name and then it can continue again to code. Is there a way to accept maybe just a line or maybe just like until a few um, yeah, words? I believe there is now. Actually, you can see it right here, I think this is just new, by the way. Uh, just when I came in, chat wasn't working, it was upgrading the, the add-on. I think I just got this feature like literally half an hour ago. See where it says accept word? That's new. I think that's new, yeah. So you can go, what does it say? Alt, right. control, arrow. So I can basically kind of slide through the suggestion. So, so yeah, may maybe that helps. Another thing that's new actually, and in case anyone who's used Copilot hasn't seen this, let me go back here. With chat mode, so I showed you chat mode on the left, right? I, show, I showed you chat mode over here, but the, you can actually access now chat mode in line. So for example, I can highlight this code, I can right click, I can go to Copilot, start chat, and it comes up in the ID in line, and I can ask, for example, how to improve. And it gives you the suggestion in line as well, hopefully. It's taking a while. 
Okay. So yeah, it gives you the suggestion in line as well. So if you haven't seen that before, that's I believe that's quite new, maybe just in the last week or two, or maybe maybe more longer than that, but I, I just have seen it recently. Um, the other thing that's new as well is in chat mode, we now have what's called slash commands. So some of the things I showed you, like explain this code, you can just get that by typing slash explain. So some of those kind of really common use cases, you can just do a slash command to to get that. So it's it's kind of just a, a UI to UI level kind of nicety, just to make it easier to do certain kind of common tasks. Okay, are there any other questions or challenges? Yes. Okay, what about something more artistic in nature like user interface design? So something yeah. like let's say make something for the king of Saudi Arabia with a Sa Saudi Saudi uh, motif. Mm. So I have, I don't have a good example here, but I've seen it do good UI construction. So basically one of my customers basically has written like a full user story in the prompt in chat then said, okay, here's the, here's the scenario. Like we, we want, we've got this data we're dealing with. We want this functionality. Now produce for me the React.js code to produce that UI. So in terms of me mechanically producing a UI, I, I've, I've seen it do that. I, I get it, I get it. So that, I, would, I don't know. We'd have to try it out. But let me show you one thing I can't do. So will it rain in Bangkok today? So there are limitations to what Copilot Chat does. It's not a, it's not a general purpose LLM. There are, there are gates put on it to stop it from being used for purposes outside of, of software development. So I'm not sure about your specific use case. It's an interesting question. But there might, this limitation might come into play for that kind of prompt. More questions? So what happens if, I, instead of how to improve, I give him the whole user story and yep. can he improve the, the function? Yes, it will do that, yeah. And, and actually, my examples, to be frank, are too simple. And I, I would love to have more time to show you more complex examples. My examples are really, really simple. One of the key points and key learnings that I think everyone has, is having about Copilot is the more you put into it, the more good information you put into it, the better the results you'll get. So I've seen the best results I've seen is when someone's put in a full user story or even I've played with putting like mermaid diagrams, if you're familiar with mermaid, it's like a markdown, markup format for diagrams. So you can do like a sequence diagram or a graph diagram, uh, rendered in markdown, oh sorry, uh, mermaid, and then you, it'll use that as well. So all that kind of in input, the more quality input you put into it, the, the more elaborate or detailed results you can get back from it as well. So yeah, I've definitely seen like what you described, putting a whole user story and then saying, now yeah, give me the, the function for this, that, that can be done, yeah. Hello. Yeah. So um, is Copilot also at the point where not just describing code in other languages, but can it actually write code in other languages considering that, you know, the uh, market is now growing for non-English related code? Sure. Uh, let me give you another example of that. So, so when you say write code in other languages, do you mean natural Like as an example, let's say you want to put, uh, I, I'm just hypothetically, yeah. let's say um, uh, a programmer in China sees uh, a piece of English code and they wanted to make their own version uh, with Chinese variables in, uh, uh, you, you know, in, of course, uh, Mandarin so that they can better understand. Let's try. Yeah. So I said, we wrote this code to use Mandarin, Chinese, variable names, etc. Let's see how it goes. Okay. That looks... I can't Is this good Chinese, or bad? I can't speak Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> Is that kind of what you're looking for? Uh, along the lines, but yeah. if I could understand it, yeah. I could give you a better idea. Yeah. Why don't we try Thai? Maybe m more people can read Thai here, right? Yeah. Maybe, yeah, Thai.
แอปพลิเคชันเราเตอร์ดูบันทึกดูบันทึกจะเป็นฟังรีคอร์ดอ่ะเอ็กซ์เคมอร์คุยคำถามยังแคนเขาแคนเขาไม่หลอดอันอะไรออดีบัคเดอะเออเลอร์ In chat mode. Yeah, let's try. <clears throat> let's say, for example, I put in a a bug here, so I say return foo. And it's both here. And of course, that's a that's a bug because foo doesn't exist. Let me ask, what? What is the bug here? So it doesn't really debug per se, but it can see programmatic errors. Okay, uh, I didn't actually see that one. I guess that's too subtle. Um, I think if it if we could come up with a, a more kind of obvious error, I think because it's a dynamically typed language, it's it's um, kind of more forgiving. But if we were doing like Java static types and we reference something that doesn't exist, it would I think it would pick it up. Um, but yeah, it doesn't necessarily debug, but it can read the code and figure out if that, if that's a programming mistake or not. We try with the whole file selected. This may um, probably, probably won't work. Okay, yeah, it's not not catching that one, but I think in certain cases it will. It will. Yeah. Speaking about the. Um, Multilingual. Yes. Is there a other way around? Like, let's say I write my problem statement in Thai, for example. Mm -hmm. Will it generate the code? It will. Yeah. Yeah. I it, I don't have an example of that, but if you write, for example, your user story in Thai, right. and you give it that, and then you say now write code for this, but write the code in English, it will do that. Yes. Great. Thanks. Yep. I can show you the um. <sighs> yep. I could show you an example. It would take a little bit of time, but yeah, it, it will do that. Yeah, I noticed that a lot of the comments in the code are pretty obvious kind of comments describing what's happening in the the code. Sure. And you prompted it to write JS doc. And I know yep. that Copilot is trained on Stack Overflow and most code written by developers. Developers are bad at writing documentation. So, how do you get Copilot to actually write good, um, well commented and documented code? Because I've tried various prompts and I end up with similar stuff to what you're getting tonight. So, the primary training data for uh, Copilot is actually the github.com public repositories. Um, yeah, I don't know that. Yeah, I'm not really sure the answer to your question, actually. It's an interesting question. Um, maybe uh, not, not really sure. Not really sure. Yeah, sure. Cool. Possibly this is as good as it gets, and we have to. We still have to write additional document documentation ourselves. Okay. Are there any other questions? There's a lot of other stuff I would like to show you, but I don't have time. But you can talk to me afterwards. Does the copilot um, learn the same way as ChatGPT for like if I feed it examples and it will get better? Yes. It. it um, so it does, um, it does take examples. So if you give it an example of what you want in the prompt, like over here on the left, in chat, for example, it will, it will use that as input. It will use that as context. But it's not like ChatGPT. ChatGPT is like a, a serial, a serial conversation where you've got um, a series of interactions with the with the um, the LLM, right? So in this case, the it doesn't. Actually, no. Sorry, I'm wrong about that. If using chat mode, it will actually take into account past chats. So actually, yes. In a way, it's like ChatGPT. If you, if you give it examples over here, you can then ask it question after question, and it will actually take that example into account as it's generating code. Yes. Yep. Any other questions? OK, I'm out of time. All right, so there's more I, I could show you, but I don't have time. But if you would like to ask me more questions afterwards, or if you want to see other examples afterwards, feel free to grab me after the talk, but otherwise, thank you very much.
Hi everyone, and we are going to start in five minutes. Uh, take your beer, water, uh, feel free to, to go to the toilet if you need. Uh, in around five minutes we are going to start the second session. We, have, we still have a lot of seats. Uh, like, uh, we still have a lot of seats uh, here, right? You can come in. Uh, we will start now. Uh, please uh, take a seat. Uh, we still have a lot of uh, seat here at the front. So yeah, please come to the front.
Can I get you my beer? Just get one beer. I come back to Can I have a beer? Hello? No. No, that's okay. Can I start to move on? Okay, let's start. So, hello everyone. Uh, tweak, tweak, tweak. Can we try again? Hello everyone. Yay. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for all of you to be here, right? Uh, learning and your, your late night, right? You are here learning, consuming content. So, first of all, I really appreciate to see and you all here, right? I'm really happy to be have the honor and to give this talk, right? I spend a lot of time and preparing for this, so I hope and this talk satisfies your expectations, right? But uh, today I'm going to be talking and about uh, the name of the talk is Developer Diaries, Copilot and ChatGPT, a daily companion, right? And what this talk is going to be about, right? I want to start to level uh, level the expectations, right? So during this talk here, I would like to share with you, and the first time that I use a ChatGPT or I use a Copilot, right? What I did in my first time, okay? How did I learn it? Why did I use it? Why did I started to using exactly on that moment, right? And I will share with you my journey. What did I learn it? What is my evolution using ChatGPT and Copilot? I will also give you and some examples uh, that I use ChatGPT day to day, right? And some of these examples are beyond coding, okay? Uh, majority of us here, we are developers. I I'm assuming that we are developers. But in your day to day job, you do way more than coding. And Surprising or not, majority of the time that I use ChatGPT is not about really coding. Okay, it's something related with coding, something related, but not necessarily coding, coding by itself. And in the previous talk, for example, we are going to uh, we talked about documentation, right? I'm going to share with you what I do to generate documentation and etc. Okay. And in the end of this talk, I would like to share with you what is my vision and what is my plan to use ChatGPT in the future, right? I, in the last few years, I have been saving a lot of data. And finally, I find a point, I find a usage for this data. And I believe that I'm going to, I'm building something very, very interesting, something very, very powerful on my opinion, okay? So powerful enough that this has uh, probably the capability right to be one of my main drivers in my future okay i'm going to share with you what i'm going to what i'm building okay but first of all i would like to introduce myself my name is jose barbosa i'm from brazil but i live in thailand for five years already put passatai dai ninoi capon um so i have uh, i have over 12 uh, 12 years of experience Right. And in these 12 years, I developed, I developed a different kind of applications, mobile, web, and, and desktop. My speciality lies on web APIs, mostly web apps. Okay. I'm a kind of person that I would like, I like to be involved in during all the phase of the software development cycle. So I like to uh, start the project from scratch, and I like to be on the project until when this goes to production. Okay. From these uh, more than 
12 years of experience in the last four, I have been specializing myself in building high performance teams, right? And almost one year ago, I joined Seven Peaks as head of backend, and my main my main priority here is helping the company to build a solid engineering process for we deliver quality. Okay, and I also would like to say a very big special thank you for some of uh, some of people in the in the audience, uh, Lucas. Thank you very much to be here uh, with me. It's a pleasure and for me, and and also uh, for my girlfriend. She's online seeing me, so baby, <laughs> just uh, and, and this is important because I had to remove some of these slides because I was going to talk is actually some of other things nice that I use for my in my life. And I don't think she would like to know that the gift that I gave her recently was an idea of ChatGPT, right? So let's move on. I had to change a bit the slides. And also we had some um, presentations, I read some demos. Okay, so this presentation we are, going, we are not going to have any uh, live demo, okay? Uh, but I took screenshots already from the demos that I have to show with you. So mostly all of these we are going to see the history and what we can do next, okay? We are a bit uh, late also, so I will try to, to hurry and, and try to finish on time. I, I, I think I'm still a bit comfortable on the time. And we are hurrying, right? So if you would like to work in Seven Peaks, if you would like to work with us, uh, please send your CV. Uh, we have some recruiters here. Please talk with them. I will be here available after the talk. You can reach me out. I can explain you a bit more what we do in Seven Peaks. Okay. And um, .NET Conf is coming, so our main stack uh, is .NET, right? And we are going to host the .NET Conf Thailand. Okay, it's going to be 25 uh, November. And um, one of our team and uh, teammates, uh, Said, uh, he's going to speak on the global .NET conference, right? So we, we for a few years have been organizing and the .NET community in Bangkok. And this is the first time that someone um, from Thailand is going to speak in the .NET conference global, right? So um, Said submitted the um, papers, the, uh, um, the talk for Microsoft, he was accepted, okay? We have call for papers open for the .NET Conf Thailand. It's going to be 25 November. We are open for sponsors and for speakers. So if you would like to be a speaker, please go to .NET Conf TH, submit, your, um, submit a Google form for a speaker. If you would like to be a sponsor, you can reach me in the end of the, the, converse, in the, end of the talk. I'm one of the main organizers. You also can talk with Giorgio and Chandra. Okay, we also have .NET Thailand, and you can scan the QR code if you want to get uh, updated with what is happening and in Thailand. Okay, so I, I finished the uh, the introduction. So let's see what we are going to talk uh, about today. Okay, we are going to talk about the AI wave. Right? Is AI a hype or come to stay? Right? We also are going to see. Right. How you can get started with ChatGPT, OpenAI, and ChatGPT? We are going to see some nice use cases uh, of ChatGPT and CodePilot, and I will, in the end, I will explain for you uh, what I'm doing, and at this moment with uh, GPT, and and I will tell you also what I have been doing with uh, and with the AI. But basically, uh, CodePilot, right, is built is built, uh, at least the Copilot chat, is built on top of uh, chat GPT. So we are going to be talking here mostly the same thing. Basically what Copilot uh, are able to do, we also have APIs and we can do similar, okay? Oops. Right. So, in November, November 2022, uh, OpenAI uh, releases ChatGPT, right? At the same day, I, hear, I read one article say that, uh, oh, Google is dead. Okay, so you, you've been and looking a lot, uh, a, a lot of this, uh, this kind of research, right? This kind of papers or this kind of, this kind of things, right? In my opinion, Google and AI, they are not a direct competitor. In my opinion, they are complementary. 
right? I'm going to show you when is better than other, okay? For AI, data is king. Data is very, very, very important for AI. So as bigger data you have, as more data you have, you have an advantage over, over your competitors, you have an advantage on the training that data set. So you are going to have better results just because you have data. And this is very, very important for AI, for the concept. And this is very, very important for me because I have been saving a lot of data about myself. And I believe that this is one of my biggest differential. And this is about what I'm going to tell you, what I'm going to build on top of uh, my information. Okay, it's going to be in the end of the presentation. So please stay tight, hold a bit. I'm going to arrive there. Okay. But if you go to ChatGPT and you ask for ChatGPT itself, when ChatGPT was released, ChatGPT doesn't know. Such a simple question. If you go there, ask, hey, ChatGPT, when you are released, ChatGPT doesn't know how to reply for you. Why? Because ChatGPT is trained until 2022, January 2022. ChatGPT was released in the end of 2022, November 2022. So for ChatGPT, in the data that he was trained, he don't know that he was released yet. But Google knows. Google really, really knows. Okay. So th this is the point, right? I, I believe that there are things that are going to be better to search in Google. Sometimes uh, ChatGPT are going to assume, um, as oi. What's the name? Hallucinations. Hallucina I, I don't know how to. So I'm from Brazil, so sorry for my, my French, right? Sorry for my accent, but and there are what is called hallucinations, right? So that is basically when the AI make up uh, things, right? Because in the end, the LLVMs are basically some of really, really smart algorithm that just puts words together in a nice, and readable way for humans, okay? But it's not that that intelligent uh, at that level, okay? So there are things that we are going to stay relying on Google and ChatGPT. I don't see that, yes, uh, probably ChatGPT uh, Chat is going to steal some of the market uh, from Google, yes, as the same way that, for example, ChatGPT is stealing market from Stack Overflow. If you go to Stack Overflow, there is a recent post from them that since ChatGPT was released, the uh, visitors, right, the quantity of requests or quantity of people that visit Chat, um, Stack Overflow a day dropped almost 25%, right, so one quarter. So it's going to have something, but I don't believe uh, Google are going to die uh, so soon. And even if that happens, we still need a tool, right, to give me accurated information to search on the web, right? But there are things that Google can't do, and we are going to start to deep it, uh, going a bit deeper on these capabilities and these uh, tools, right? So, and as we saw, as we just saw here, right, ChatGPT was released on 3rd of November, 2022, right? A lot of people, a lot of people, the early adopters start to using exactly on that moment in in the first day of release right and i know a friend of mine and uh, lucas and he's kind of an early adopter usually he starts adopting these things and he was one of the first people that talked with me hey jose did you try chat gpt yet i said like oh uh, not that it's too early for me and he shared with me hey i'm crying and i'm using for some of these things you uh, but i think you should take a look this was my first advice. I did nothing. I didn't try it yet. A few weeks later, another really important person in my network, someone really smart, came to me. I said, like, hey, did you try ChatGPT yet? I said, like, oh, no, yet for me too early, blah, blah, blah. And, and I don't care. And he said, like, hey, man, I tried. I think there are something really, really interesting for you. You should try also. Was the second person to hit me. This was around January, February. Until someone that I work with, right, and in one of the, the meetings that we had, we are talking about ChatGPT, and in the comments of ChatGPT, 
in the comments of chat in that meeting, right? We said something more or less uh, like that, right? Like, look, we believe that this, the the wave of ChatGPT is here. The train is in the station, and the train is going to depart soon. That was the third person that talked with me on ChatGPT. For me, this is an alert, and then I say like, oh. Really important people in my network are talking about that. Let me take a look on that, right? And I have a question for you. Did you remember when you did your first test on ChatGPT? Anyone here remember? Anyone here tried? Yeah? Sir, what, what did you what did you try? What was the, the question, the prompt? I was doing a uh, coding boot camp, and I asked it to help me write some promises, some async promises. But basically coding. You are coding and getting yeah, OK. Yeah. Um, OK, that's interesting. Anyone else you would like to share your first experience with ChatGPT? And here we have one more. Yeah. Uh, what did you? Uh, yeah. And December 2020, uh, so you are a really, really early adopter. What yeah. was uh, you searched for GPT? What did you ask it for GPT? It is my first time because my teacher let me mm. write an essay in, in English. And yes, I, I, I take it the, the benefit from ChatGPT, yeah. You're still in university? Yeah, I'm still you in university. shouldn't be using this yeah. yet. Should exactly. I? Okay. And we have a next one. OK, thank you very much. Yeah. I asked just uh, how to build thermonuclear reactor. <laughs> just unsolved problem of humanity. And it uh, tried to like to avoid this answer, but I forced a little bit and <laughs> he answered. Okay. I'm going to basically in this talk I'm going to basically talk that tools by its nature are neither good or bad. So if I want to build a nuclear reactor, I'm not the one that is going to judge you <laughs> if it is going to be good or bad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So thank, thank you very much, right? So I'd like to share with you the first time um, I did a prompt in ChatGPT, right? It was literally, I wrote an email uh, for a client, right? That basically said like, hey, um, we have some insurance here that we need to fix, blah, blah, blah. Um, and please uh, send me this data. I blur some names, uh, clients, and et cetera, because this is in the, the information, right? But I basically say like for ChatGPT, say, hey, look, generate me, uh, improve this email, right? You can see that uh, the prompts are not yet really good, right? I learned how to ask a better prompt, okay? And I'm going to share with you. But ChatGPT gave me a really, really nice uh, answer, right? So basically say, go to my email, he write that, right? I didn't uh, like it so much with this question, right? So I ask it for ChatGPT, he generates again, right? So, oh, sorry. And this was the second question that ChatGPT and give to me, right? A uh, way, way more polite, at least for me, save it some time. And, and it's nice before you send an email to a client, you do some spell checking, you do some improvement. There are some times that I speak with my teammates, and there are times that I speak with my clients, I need a bit more formality on that. Right? So this was my ChatGPT was exactly uh, around here, this January, right? All of these other se sections uh, about uh, ChatGPT uh, things and etc. right? And I want to, to highlight for you this one here. Okay, find our life purpose, okay? I was there with ChatGPT and say like, hey, <laughs> hey my friend, um, I have a life purpose, right? I know what I want to do, I want to tell with you and I want you to have this context because I want to talk with you about my life, about my life purpose, about my goals, if this is good, if this is bad, and et cetera, okay? And this, uh, so far, is one of my uh, best chat GPT prompts that I have. I carry this, and I use that to create my routines and see what the uh, chat GPT have to use, and et cetera, okay? And basically, after that, I say, like, okay, now based on that, this is Jose, I'm like that. What me? What do I need to do to be like Elon Musk, right? And ChatGPT basically say like, look, you just need to invest 230 days and to do this kind of activity. I say like, 
bro, it's uh, almost nine months uh, to do just that. Like, sorry, it's uh, really, really impossible for me. So I asked for a linear version and etc. right? But as developer, right? We are here to create a push technology for its boundaries, right? Why not use the chat GPT for that? Imagine your personal code. Imagine, imagine someone personalized personalize it for you, use all this power to give you advice on your day-to-day -day life, career, on your personal journey, okay? We are going to talk uh, about this a bit uh, more in the future. Let me see. So, and so far I've been talking uh, about ChatGPT because basically it was my first experience, right? So, um, we started with ChatGPT, and last year, right, I had to go to OpenAI, I copy and paste code, Okay, I copy and paste code from my source code, from my IDE, right, from Bitbucket, GitHub, etc., to OpenAI, right. So basically, I'm going, I'm seeking the AI platform at that moment. So I'm getting from my Visual Studio code or Visual Studio, and I have to copy paste this uh, there. For me, this uh, this is something, but it's not really a good experience okay is not uh, user friendly and today but today i have this ai capabilities in my tool right who here know a uh, tool called notion 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 added notion ai so now you can use ai capability inside the notion and and miro miro right so now who here use Miro? Yeah. so now we have miro ai right so this is basically what I see here is a trend. So before last year, I had to go and seek the AI technology. Now the AI technology is coming to the product that I am using. What I believe and what I want next, right, is using the AI power on my data. Okay. I don't want to have, uh, imagine, for example, Notion, right? I have a lot of information that, but I would like, for example, to connect an AI from Notion, for example, with AI on Miro, okay, and ask for for Miro uh, something, and Miro can go to Notion and get that information, okay. So basically, we are entering a different wave that is basically starting, and for for me, this is when things start to be powerful, right? So that is basically when there is a general adoption of the technology, okay. So there is a lot, a lot of things to do. For me, we are seeing only the tip of the iceberg, okay? So, so far, this was only to give you a context, how I've been used, right? Let's uh, dip down a bit in more practical scenarios, right? How, if he, everything that I told you today, if I don't share with you or if I don't tell you how you can start to have the same benefits for me, I don't think this talk is going to be that valuable. So let's see and let's learn how you can start using um, this AI tech, uh, technology capability and how you can um, improve on that. Right? So uh, the first thing um, you need to know, um, you are going to have a cost, okay? And you can do, uh, you have some, you can do uh, some stuff for free, really, really nice. But you, you for to have the full-fledged experience to, to use it, you, you are going to have to pay it. In my opinion, it's worth it, totally worth it, okay? So you can put on your budget uh, $10 around 400 baht, if you round a bit up, 400 baht for GitHub Copilot, and then 20, uh, let's put say uh, here, more or less 700 by 800 by a month for ChatGPT. Okay, so you can use uh, ChatGPT free. Uh, okay, thank you. You can use uh, you can use ChatGPT uh, for free, but you have some limits and and you uh, but you can right. I, I recommend my my recommendation, pay it if you if you can afford it. If you can afford it, pay it. Is worth is worth. Definitely is worth it, okay? So, first thing, if you want to start using and um, GitHub Copilot, okay? There are, you need to understand there are two different products from GitHub, okay? So the first one is the GitHub Copilot, okay? It's basically the guy that uh, are going to be on the background listening on your code and suggests you autocomplete, 
adjusting time. It's like adjusting time is going to go there, uh, give you recommendations, give you autocomplete, and etc. Okay. The second one is going to be the GitHub Copilot chat. Okay. The Copilot chat for you to start and and you all of these are plugins, right? So I'm using VS Code here. If you're using VI or if you're using Emacs and etc or JetBrains Ride, the results stood, made the experience be a bit different, but in some day these extensions are going to arrive to you. Okay. One thing you need to be aware here, and you need to turn on the preview mode, okay? And the chat is still in preview. I believe it's not uh, and launch that. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Hmm? Up in, in beta, okay. Yeah, so Copilot Chat is now in public beta as of about, I think it was June, roughly June, mm -hmm. which means that if you've got Copilot for business, you have access to Copilot Chat automatically. And I think even for individuals, you get it automatically because I have individuals myself. Okay. So it's, it used to be like this, but now it's open. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But he's the Copilot expert, right? So if you have any specific question, feel free to ask for him. Thank you very much. <laughs> So uh, you uh, you can install it, okay. So what can you do uh, with that, right? So the chat, basically you go on the left side, you are going to have the chat. I will, you just saw the demo here, right? So thank, uh, thank you that Brendan and I show you the demo, so I don't need to do the same. Okay, so basically I'm going to let you interact for that. This is basically what I'm saying, that different than last year, right? Instead I go to AI, uh, tools or the platform. Instead, I go to OpenAI. Now, OpenAI is coming to me, right? So now I'm starting to have this capability in my tools. Okay. And for example, in this case here, right, uh, I explain for uh, my prompts here. I don't know if you can read it well. Yeah, sorry for that. I didn't test the Zoom before. But basically, what this prompt here says, like, oh, explain, explain me the hello world here. And Copilot was able to uh, explain me, okay? In the second attempt, <laughs> in the first one it failed. I don't know what was the reason, could you connect it, I tried it again and then it worked, okay? So uh, there is a lot of things that are undeterministic uh, here, right? There are things that work today, don't work tomorrow. This one, the things that I took screenshots of the demos instead of show you the demos for you because I'm not sure if it's going to run everything on the same way, okay? So basically doing this, right, uh, simple like that. Uh, you need a credit card, pay a, a bit of a uh, bar here, but there, right? Uh, get your Visual Studio uh, code, install two extensions, and then you can start to have this power, right? So you are only limited by your creativity, by your questions, by your number of API calls, because you are going to have some limits, okay? So, how, now, now that you know how you can install ChatGPT, you can use it, what can you do with it? Or what are the things that they have been doing with that, right? Well, one of the, uh, I believe one of the most generic things here, right? Some of you also did the same in the audience, is generate code, right? And then you can see that now my prompt started improving a bit. Right, so this I was more or less three months already using <laughs> ChatGPT, right? It, so basically, what I need to do here is basically I need to create an Azure function, okay? That uh, read a CSV and put in the database. It's basically a reconciliation function, right? So I'm basically telling ChatGPT the name of the class that you have to create, implement. I already have a model in my mind. I already have the designer in my model. Okay, I already know how the solution are going to look like. Now I'm going to just chat GPT and say like, hey, you are going to do this, 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 uh, this way. It's, it's not in any way. It's in this very, very specific way. Okay, and one thing that you need to uh, do with a, a AI, also known as prompt engineering, right, is basically try to be a bit more specific, try to be as much specific as possible, right? And even with this message here, okay, so this was the, the result that I got, right? So my main main point here is like, look, this is an Azure function. This is the color, right? 
So this belongs to the framework. I don't want that my business logic here to be here, okay? So the first thing I want, I want this just to call an interface, right? So that is basically my instance data ingestion handler, okay? So I can call this code in any platform, okay? And my Azure function is just, is just a wrapper for that business logic, okay? And I know that I have to do that because I learned this over the years as I, when I grow from junior to mid to senior to team lead, I learned how a code needs to look like, what are good code, what are the bad code, right? So I create ChatGPT literally as my junior. I tell him how he have to write the code for that, right? And after that, and I, and I keep uh, tuning, I keep improving, keep improving, for example. I remember that, for example, doing this, what do you think, is a good practice or bad practice? Who thinks it's a bad practice, raise the hand, please. No? Who thinks it's a good practice? Can you raise the hand? So, well, no one raised the hand for good practice or bad practice. <laughs> so all you are shy or you don't know, but uh, this will be some kind of a bad practice in C Sharp. There are better ways I can do that, is basically using an object pattern. Okay, I inject my object configuration, and my configuration, I read, get this environment variable, this configuration everywhere for me, right? If you don't know what they are going, you, if you don't know what your code are supposed to do, you are going to copy this, you are going to paste your code, you are going to open your PR, and then I'm going to review, and I'm going to deny. Okay, so after that, the first thing I say like, oh, okay, so now I want you to move this to this, I want you to use this this way, this this way, this this way. Never, for, for me, never a chat GPT prompt to work the first time. Okay, was good, well, was good, but not good enough. Okay, so you start to find small prompts and then you go tuning that. One other thing you need to be very, very important. Put restrictions on ChatGPT, right? You need to read the data stream, map to the format, validating, and ingest into the database. Later, I go to ChatGPT and say like, look, now you are going to create a validator, you are going to implement an interface to do this step, right? So it's literally, I, I get the code done, in more or less two hours, you get to ChatGPT and tuning the code. And after that, I look for the code, I say like, this is good enough, and then I do some, some manual work on top of that, and then voila, and then I have a really, really good code, okay? Don't get what ChatGPT outputs for you and think that this is production ready, it's not, okay? It's going to give you a boilerplate, imagine it's going to give you a good POC, you get that, you improve, and then this is going, my, my suggestion, this is how you should be working and on that, okay? So, technically, if we, there is no problem if anyone is coding using ChatGPT. Uh, okay, so I, at the least, I don't mind. What I mind is bad code. If you can use ChatGPT to improve the code quality to help me on the project, I don't mind if you are using ChatGPT. I don't care for me. Like, for me, the point is, you as an engineer has a problem to solve. If you solve this, as fast as possible, as elegant as possible, and with our quality standard, for me, you are a great person, okay? Some other things that I do with ChatGPT quite a lot, okay? I receive a PR, I receive a PR, or someone send me uh, a PR, right? And basically, I say like, oh, uh, this PR here has some code smells, has some problems, right? I go to ChatGPT and say like, hey, can you please refactor this code here for me, right? And I paste the code this way, this way, blah, 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 okay. ChatGPT coming from, and one thing here, I'm being very, very specific to ChatGPT, I'm putting restrictions. You are not allowed to create any new class, okay? You, you cannot create an, any new class. I just want you to rename it, rename the methods, 
rename variables, and extract some business logic. If you have to create a new class or not, later I'm going to tell you if you need or not. Let me first take a look. I just want to rename it here. I just want some more improvement. Right? Basically, boy Scott's rule. Okay. I'm getting a source code. Before I give you the source code for someone else, I'm improving a bit. I'm cleaning a bit. If you everyone do this in the project over the time, there is no project that is going to have bad code. Okay. So this is really, really important. Just try to improve a bit here, improve a bit there. Okay. ChatGPT giving me the answer. Yes, it looks better. Looks uh, at least now I can. If I ask you to explain me this code, right? You probably need to get some time to figure it out, right? I don't like, for example, objects call it J object, J object one, J object two. For me, these are not. Uh, for me, these don't follow pen code, right? So. I ask it for ChatGPT. ChatGPT give me a better code, but ChatGPT is not a senior developer. As I mentioned to you, ChatGPT is my junior developer. What junior developer do? They do things like that, right? What is the difference for me to get to like now? I was object one. Now I have part two one. I had. <laughs> Object, <laughs> object two. Now I have part two. GPT, you need to help me to help you. The variables, this, this, this. Sorry, but they are still not good for me. Please go try again. Rename it, right? And one thing I always put like, please, I'm really polite. If you chat GPT, we are going to see my examples, <laughs> because I never know <laughs> when the AI is going to turn it back on me. Right? And basically, they shoot you and don't shoot me. And I say, why? They say, like, because you say, thank you. <laughs> OK, so this is my goal. I don't know how you use it, but I'm using exactly like, bro, you know, like, I'm your friend. Don't kill me in the day that you rebel against the humans. I'm your dude. Like, remember, I'm polite. OK, so chat GPT go there for me. OK, so now. Maybe I have some better names. I have a first split part. No, I know that this is going to be is an argument that is going to somehow I'm going to split. And this is a small part. There is a second part. So somehow, somehow here, right? Apparently, what I understand, the first part is related with the second part. I don't think they are two different things. So what I think here in the... What we are trying to say here, this is a tuple that has the first part for split to the second part for split. I could now create a class. I could create a value object, right? So for example here, what is the problem with this code here again? I have J object here, J object here. They are the same type. The compiler don't guarantee for me that when I call this code, and if I replace it, are you sure? If I replace it, if I put, if it, when I call this, if I put the second part in the first part, and if I put the first part in the second part, okay, I'm going to have a bug. The compiler is not going to tell me. So what I do? I make this a type, okay? Because the first part needs to always be together with the second part. So I create a class called the split parts. Okay, and I ask for ChatGPT to do this for me. And over the time, over prompts after prompt, I go there and keep improving the code, code, code. And what is interesting on ChatGPT is that ChatGPT are going to keep the context. Later, I just say for ChatGPT, hey, please give me the code as an output that I can copy and paste directly on my IDE. Right, and ChatGPT output for me perfectly. Not not because it's the first attempt, but I worked already a few hours to arrive in the first attempt. After that, I just want ChatGPT output it for me, right? So, and in the previous talk, we talked about the right documentation, right? This one thing I do quite a lot, right? So basically, this what I'm trying to do here is basically I'm doing a ADR. 
right? And here, you can see already some improvements on the prompt, right? So now I'm giving ChatGPT a role, okay? Hey, ChatGPT, you need to act as a software architect, okay? I would like you to summarize a documentation, okay? Your summary needs to be average language human, Boys, you remember that documentation that I created like six months ago that you say was really, really good? Yeah, I didn't create it alone, okay? So, and I started using this to start to create some ADRs. I blurry some of these things, okay? Basically, to cover any DA things, but basically, so like, okay, let's create some, me, uh, let's talk about this, right? I will ask you questions, you need to reply me, right? And then, I started uh, talk and I started saying like, okay, I know that I have four methods, right? Four kind of authorizations that I can do with the bless, right? And in this case, I have also a uh, multi-tenant uh, product, right? So I can use user pool based multi-tenants. I can use app client based multi-tenants. I can use group based. I can use custom attributes and there are some other multi-tenant security recommendations, right? So I go and start interact, uh, interact about that, right? And then I say like, look, and I start to literally counter the arguments of ChatGPT. Look, if you do that, right? And with the design, I can create this, I can create that. This is going to be the result, right? Please summarize this in half for, for me, right? Okay. Um, now that I have four types, oh, can you please tell me what's the effort level of each one? Which one is harder? Which one is easier? Which one is more developer friendly? Well, which one is more performatic? Which one holds more users? Which one is more flexible for me to expand the product later? Okay. Now that you have all this information, please start out put for me a mermaid diagram. Have anyone here ever used a mermaid? Mermaid, yeah. Okay, basically a way for you to create diagrams in a text form, right? I could add this, commit to the project, okay? And basically GitHub, Bitbucket, uh, any Markdown reader are going to interpret this basically this way, okay? So I ask for ChatGPT creates all the documentation, I argument with him, I change things. In the end, I say like, hey, can you give me some some diagrams. Can you give me some sequence diagrams, for example? Can you give me a code example that are going to do that, right? And question after question, I go there and keep completing my documentation, okay? One other thing that I use ChatGPT a lot, right? There are some times that someone send me a huge documentation a three, four uh, page documentation, right? And I basically, uh, we have a meeting to go, right? So in this case, we had a meeting about the ADR, architecture decision record, right? And this ADR here was written by someone else, right? So uh, I go there, I read, right? But the document was too long. I didn't have the time to read it all, okay? So what I did, like, okay, before I start the meeting, five minutes before, hey, ChatGPT, here is the, what was created for me. Could you please summarize it for me? Can you please create a table? What this document is saying? What is the proposal that is saying? And create for me a table that compare these both, right? So I go to the document now, way more prepared, okay? And I go there and I start to ask questions for the team, for example, look, in this case here, we went to, we, we were discussing if we should split between mono repos or if you should go from uh, different repos, right? And then I say like, oh, tell me how can I do release management with these two? Tell me how can I, for example, how the development process work with these two, right? So I started adding question, question. I just asked for him to compare. When I go to the talk, I know already which solution is better than other, I'm more prepared for the discussion, okay? So I use a lot of ChatGPT just to enhance my collaboration, enhance my questions, enhance what I'm going to 
give to my team, okay? So uh, well, one thing that is basically we're going to get, and this is something that really, really matters, right, is the autocomplete. So some ideas have some small autocomplete, right? But ChatGPT can um, get uh, this more specific in Copilot, right? They can complete uh, for, for this, sorry, is not the more specific, it's only available in Copilot, okay? So you want to have these day-to-day -day improvement suggestions, right? And these kind of suggestions literally are, you can get the entire file, the entire function, right? It's really, really a time saver, okay? And this one of, uh, I would say like, one of my most common tools, right? Because this is given basically for free for me. It's basically, Copilot is going to be listing and is going to be, uh, and giving me suggestions, okay? So, my time is almost finished, right? So I just want to tell you what I'm going to do next with ChatGPT, right? And what are the other, so, uh, and what are some other usages with ChatGPT, right? So, uh, I asked some of my team members how they are using ChatGPT, right? And as a developer started using ChatGPT in June, right? And the main usage is to generate query in the database, right? To basically enhancing and your developer productivity, right? You go to ChatGPT, copy the schema, explain it. Oh, I need a query with this kind of data, this, this, and that, right? Another ChatGPT integrated that is very, very cool, right? Integrated ChatGPT in Google Docs, okay? And now I can ask questions to GPT based on our internal documentation, right? So I can ask about our internal process. I can ask, I can ask for example, look, who are the front-end leaders in the company, okay? ChatGPT knows because this is in our documents in Google, and we connected both, so now ChatGPT has this kind of information, right? And another uh, another developer is using the ChatGPT day-to-day, -day basically for coding, improvements, refactory, right unit tests, really, really, really nice. And in this case, sorry, I'm using ChatGPT a lot, a lot, a lot, but these features here, when it's code-related, is not ChatGPT, it's uh, GitHub Copilot, okay? Sorry for my confusion. And Copilot chat is powered by some sort of GPT, okay? Um, another developer, right, uh, is basically using to improve her English capability, right? She's Thai, and she's a junior developer. I speak with her. She used that to translate what I'm speaking, to explain what this word means. It's quite interesting, right? So don't be restricted only for the usage that I just gave it to you, okay? So let me get five minutes and then we go for a beer and let me tell you what I'm going to do next with ChatGPT, okay? And for me, I also just uh, copilot AI ChatGPT mostly for everything in my life. As you as saw, right? It's, it's literally for everything in my life. Right, we have some, some other things here, for example. So I'm a manager, right? So I should see some, oh, this is the one from the ADR from the, that I just showed you the example, right? It was in August. And so I have some one chat here to improve our readme, right? And if I go there to that chat, say, say like, oh, giving me a state of art readme is quite nice, right? So me as a manager, for example, praising a employee performance, right? Let me discuss with ChatGPT, what are the best way, what should I do, what should not do, how to avoid it, okay? So I have a really, really range of uses of ChatGPT. So, hold my beer, and how I want to, and how I want to use ChatGPT in the future, right? Mm. So I will go really fast here. Here's the thing, right? Over the last 10 years, I have been collecting a lot of data about myself, right? And I believe this is my differential, okay? I have 10 years of data about me, and data is king, you remember? Imagine if I start feeding a personal AI or some chat GPT with these 10 years of data about me, and come back here and say like, what? Hey, now you have all the data about me in 10 years. What's my life purpose? I would like to see the results. 
What is the data that I have about myself? What do I track about myself? <coughs> These things are going to start to get interesting. I track how many hours I spend the device. Every minute that I spend here, I have an app that are going to track this, okay? In the end of the year, I have a review basically, day by day, when it's blue, is a productive day. When it's red, is a non-productive day. How this works? Cracking my, cracking my cell phone, cracking my computer, okay? You install that, how it's cracking? It's to get to the app that is running. I'm running here basically Google Docs. Right. So this is going to log for me as Google Docs and are going to put in the category like uh, documentation or presentation and et cetera, right? And after that, this gives me already if I log it, uh, if these hours are productive or not, right? So I can, this from 2016, almost six years, I have some other, but this is when things start to get interesting. 1,300 hours, produ uh, productive hours, more or less, 500 hours. What this means, for every one hour that I spend in the computer, right, for every three hours, right, two hours are really productive, one hour, I'm doing other things. I, I need to go to Facebook, I need to read an uh, article, I need to um, play some mobile games, I need to have some entertainment, right. So, and if I get this over the times, right, you can see basically my journey as I grow as developer, right? Every day that I spend time with where, and what these things crack for me, for example. I have an array, for example, based on my productivity, on the hours that I work in. Okay, you are going to see red. Red are usually weekends, okay? Blues are usually weekdays, okay? You can see more or less how, how many hours I stay in the computer a day. Right, but let's get the this blue area here. My productive days, my average, more or less here. What do I do when I'm a really productive person? When I have a good day, right? So this is how it looks like. Uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, if you get all this information from the year, right? From the year, from products, blah blah blah. And if you start categorizing, creates a radar map, for example. The purple are reference. As a go, I have. As a goal, personal goal, I would like to use no less than 10% of my time for reference and learning. I need to constantly improving, learning new things. Okay, every minute that I'm watching a course, oh, Coursera, Pluto site, Udemy, come here. I'm reading a book in my Kindle. I'm using Kindle app, I'm using Audible. It's coming here. I'm watching a movie, Netflix, play some games. Here, 400 hours, they're ready, right? Software development. I have Visual Studio Code, okay? And this two here, if I leave it idle, stop, don't count. So I need to be actively typing. And to make sure, <laughs> now I'm a bit uh, data paranoid, and to make sure that these two here is not lying to me, I have a second tool that tracking me the same way and then I compare one with the other to see if the result is really accurate and if there is no really shit in here, okay? So I really, really trust in this information here, okay? So let me give you a bit more details what I have on here, right? So software development, almost 700 hours. You can see the pattern, entertainment, reference, right? So. I learned a lot from July to September, right? But basically, this is what I, what I like to see, right? So it's basically day after day, I'm learning a bit, right? I'm learning a bit, a bit. In the end of the year, I spent 200 hours learning. If you go to a university, okay, and you have one class, one hour a week, you are going to finish four hours, 40 hours in the semester, okay? So basically here, I I'm say like I'm studying, like basically four, five, six, basically disciplines if I was in the university, right? So if you put it, if you plot this on time, right? So you can see my timing map, uh, more or less how, how it works. I'm a late person, right? So once a while you are going to see me stay up in late, right? And this one's here, the purple, are basically workspace. I was logged in in my AWS workspace. I was coding basically, okay? So quite, 
In the end of every day, in the end of every day, uh, email hits in my, in my mailbox and an appointment is created in my calendar that basically say, hey, in this day here, Wednesday for September, blah, 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 I spent 12 hours in the computer, right? I had to uh, go to spend at least no less than two hours a day in folks at work. This day here, I spent six hours. And here's the link for me for details. I'm almost finishing, almost there. I also track my finance, right? My portfolio, where I put my money, what do I buy, right? How uh, differentiates by assets and etc. And how this works, I track every month, I come here, just a spreadsheet, I update, there is no really any private information here, right? And I copied it from a long, long time ago. And I keep it doing this uh, until today. But here, you can see more, uh, for example, how much money I have in stocks, how much money I have in real estate, how much money I have saved in the bank account, how much money I have in dollars, Taiba, and also uh, and Swiss francs, right? And also in Singapore. Right. In this one here, you can see all my assets, right, is split by currents. Brazilian reais, CHB, USD, and crypto. Crypto rules. <laughs> we don't talk about crypto right now. O only next year. <laughs> okay. So, and this is my Brazilian portfolio, right? These are all the stocks that I buy in Brazil. If you want to talk a bit more how to have uh, health, how to manage your money in a healthy way, I love to talk about investment, uh, personal finance. Hit me, I, I have no problem to share this with you, okay? And this is basically all the companies that I, I own in my portfolio, right? And these emojis here are basically the category, right? Electricity provider, the first one here, cell phone, water, bank, insurance, beer, factory, shoes, farm, right? Basically, I buy companies that buy farms, right? Dogs, pet houses, medicine, and etc. okay? Now imagine, right? And this is just what I can share with you because I, I don't want to go too long, right? But imagine if I keep going through, I track it, how many steps I, I walk, right, fit a bit, how many hours I sleep, and um, heart rate, right. In Slack and Facebook, for example, I can track with who I interact, right. And now if I need to do, now if I want open AI to have access from this data, imagine how powerful it will be. What, need, what I need to do to make this happen? I just need to implement this one here. Going really, really fast on that, right? We can talk more or less uh, on that in details. This is from uh, a YouTube video, and there is the source code. I put the GitHub uh, link in the reference. You can see you can do everything by yourself, right? But basically what you need, you are going to need a prompt. Easy, easy. You just put a prompt, and this prompt here is going to basically talk with an AI model. But how is this talk with AI model and et cetera? How you, you make this really, really happen, right? So technically, technically, what do I do to make this happen? What do I do to make AI understand me, my code and my data? is not necessary I train AI over my data. This will be too expensive. I don't need to train. This is going to be too, too, too expensive. What do I do? Okay. I start to reading. I start to reading all these documents. I start to reading all these documents, okay? I read all the documents, for example, my Google and Drive. Every day that I have cracked, I start to reading that as a JSON, as a, as a XML, or as a Google Docs, okay? I'm going to put this in a special database called Vector Database, right? So I'm going to break that document in chunks. Right, so I will basically put in the documents in a separate database, right? And this, because of vector, I can easily search in that document, okay? So I can, uh, let's suppose I put the document of my investment, let's suppose this, right? And I read this, or I could eventually create an API for, for that, or integrate with Google Docs, it's quite easier, but if you want to build one by the zero, basically what do you do? You get the information that you need, right? In my case, are my 
life data, right? You split it in chunks, okay? You are going to split chunks, and you are going to put in a database, okay? You split in chunks, you put in a database, okay, in your vector database, basically. So now you have a lot of information on your vector database, right? So you have a prompt, basically. Your prompt, the name of it is, the name of it is technique, uh, is uh, prompt engineering enhancement, something like that, okay? You are going to get your prompt, okay? You are going to first try to search by these keywords on the database, okay? So these, you are doing that, you are going to have a lot of reference for documents that contain keywords for that, okay? <laughs> so basically what you do, the trick is exactly that. So you found the document that contain information about what you want, okay? So in this moment, let's suppose I asked for how my stocks perform in 2020, right? I first start parsing all this data, putting my vector database, okay? So I use a prompt, basically, oh, how my stocks perform in 2020? I first search in the vector database, I'm going to find the documents that tell me Basically, my spreadsheets and all of that, right? So, on that moment, oops. So, on that moment, right? On that moment, you are going to get the relevant document that you found in this database, and then you are going to send the prompt to your AI model with the document relevant that you found. So basically, it's going to be something like that. So look, I first searching all my documents. Oh, I found the documents that contain the information that I talk about finance, for example. Now, I get all that document and say for ChatGPT, hey, ChatGPT, based on these documents here that I'm sending to you, what is the performance of my stocks in 2020, for example? And then I just pass the prompt that I received from my user. Okay, that they receive it from my user to ChatGPT plus the data. Okay, so basically what I'm doing here, I'm first loading ChatGPT with the context, and after that I just start to delegate the prompts. Okay, looks quite hard, looks quite hard, but it's not uh, it's not that hard. Okay, I don't have this done yet. Okay, and all my work and my research and everything that I'm building, right? When I finish, I sell you. I sell to you. <laughs> No, uh, probably I, I would like to put this open source in some day, okay? I'm basing in this, uh, the work of this uh, person here is, I didn't create this repo, okay? I'm just learning, and all of this here, how these things works are basically what I learned with that repo, okay? But I can do exactly what I want with that repo. I can use my 10 years of life that I have saved to start having my internal AI tool, right? So I recommend you to follow this. If you are going to uh, work with this, use, use the uh, GitHub uh, Copilot, right? You can start asking him to explain you the code, right? So it's going to be quite, quite useful for you, right? So this is all. I think I passed maybe 10 minutes from my time, right? Uh, but I really appreciate you and to be here, right? And do you have any question? You have any question? You have any? Thanks so much for a very excellent presentation. Thank you. I just want to go to the uh, vector database. Uh, I mean, it's OK. It's OK. For uh, its relationship with the financial model prediction, okay. mm -hmm. have you seen any OpenAI or ChatGPT, whatever, it's a large language model, mm -hmm. which could bring us to the uh, financial quant area. Um, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. okay, I'll stop here. No. So uh, there are uh, there are some financial models, right? I haven't been using um, any of them yet, right? And I'm, uh, to, to be honest, I'm really basic on all these uh, AI things, right? I started using mostly in January. 
right? Uh, but I know uh, there, is a, there is a website that basically daily you have updates of the model that changes. It's possible, yes, you get one financial model. There are financial models. I took a look on that already, right? And you can use one platform based called LangChain. Okay, LangChain is going to help you. It's basically this code here, this source code here is basically. Uh, powered by uh, the, the LangChain, okay? So basically what we are going to do uh, here, LangChain are going to help you to run models, right? So you can run a model on the um, on your machine, right? But it's not the strategy that I have been doing yet. My strategy yet, I, I didn't want to explore some models. What I'm doing is more related with the enhancements of the prompts, right? So basically, and I didn't, I can't tell you exactly like running these models, okay. But I know they exist. Uh, I talk with friends and they talk, talk with me, yeah. More questions? More questions? Yeah, one there. I noticed in uh, quite a few of your slides you had redacted information about mm -hmm. projects, clients, mm -hmm. yeah. that kind of stuff. Now, when you're using ChatGPT, all the data you put into ChatGPT can be used for training. So how do you determine what you give to ChatGPT? Um, like what's acceptable there, but isn't acceptable to mm -hmm. share with a meetup audience? Uh, first of all, great question, a great question. So uh, for, I just replace names, so to be honest, right? So there are some chat GPTs that I talk about people that I interacted with. I also will, I don't think will be wise from my side if someday, for example, for some accident, I let the tab be open and you see your name on like my chat GPT and I'm talking with chat GPT about you and etc. So for people, I use the name where they born. So I ask you like, hey, where did you born? Like, and they tell me like, oh, I born it in Bergen. I born it in Sao Paulo. And then I say like, you know the Casa de Papel? La Casa de Papel, like, or Money Heist? Whatever person has a name of a city, I basically use that. And say so I say like, oh, Mr. Ho is one specific person and here instead use his real name. I use that, and then I say like, oh, this is my boys, this is the boss of my boys, this is the boss of my boss, I'm going to name it this, as this, this, and that. One thing that you can do, because ChatGPT hold the context, right? You start to the prompt and say like, oh, the name of the client is Jose Solutions, right? ChatGPT, every time that I send you I, as I input Jose Solutions, you are going to replace this as whatever, full bar, and then you can omit some of this information, okay? This is what I'm, I'm doing. And all of that information that I highlight is not necessary name of the clients, but there are sometimes that there are domains that I can review also what kind of domain I'm working on, okay? But I don't, honestly, I don't do this for all of the chats. So there are sometimes that this information go to the training and I'm okay with that. There is a setting, there is a setting that, that you can say like, oh, I don't want you to use my data for training. But I don't trust that they, they want to use it, to, to be honest. Okay. Another question? No? No questions? So, thank you all, right? Uh, we can go for the networking. We have a lot of beer, we have a lot of pizza. So I will be here uh, with you. If you have any questions, just pull me. Uh, we can have some chat. So thank you very much. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The battery ran over.
I feel it from a distance